The other basic type of pure substance is compounds. And compounds, by definition, have a fixed composition, but they're capable of being broken down into elements by chemical means. All right? Um, mixtures, remember, ha have variable composition and can be broken down into their pure substances by physical means, by physical methods of separa separation. That's how we can separate mixtures. For example, if I have uh, a mixture of two types of sand that have different diameters, I can separate them by sifting them. Um, or if I've got some salt dissolved in water, I can separate the salt from the water by evaporating off the water. That's, that's a physical separation, and that's how we separate mixtures. Compounds have a fixed composition, they cannot, they, but they can be broken down into elements, but only by chemical means, okay? Um, and the elemental composition, what elements are in that compound, the types of atoms of elements that are in that compound indicate the type of compound that you have. And um, the actual elemental composition can be inferred from the name. So what's really, really important about pure substances and identifying the different types of pure substances is being able to name them properly. All right. For mixtures, you know, we call it air. There's all different kinds of air depending on where you sample it. But for pure substances, the, main, the name means everything. The name is going to tell me exactly what type and what number of type of atom um, make up that particular compound. All right. Now, um, so that's why naming is so important. So for the elements, you know, I don't expect you to memorize all the names of all the elements. But I do expect you to start keeping track of the common elements that we've been mentioning. For example, you should know that helium is an element. You should know by recognizing the name that carbon is, is an element. All right. Now, back to naming compounds. When you name compounds, for example, sometimes there's common names that are used and everybody just kind of knows what it is. And other times we have systematic names. And from the systematic name, we can figure out exactly what types and what number of type of atom are in that compound. Uh, water. Water is the common name for this particular um, compound. And this compound, uh, the, the formula, the chemical formula is H2O. So when I say the word water, you know, there's no, I'm not saying, you know, dihydrogen oxide. If I said dihydrogen oxide, I would immediately know that there's two hydrogens and one oxygen. But everybody knows that water is H2O. So that's one common name that you need to remember, that water is the common name and the formula is H2O. The other, there's one other um, molecule that I'm going to require that you remember the common name for, and that, that molecule is ammonia. So while we're talking about it, I'm just going to go ahead and write it down right here. Ammonia, the common name or the formula for ammonia is NH3. All right? Two uh, compounds that were identified a long, long time ago before people knew anything about atoms and just given names, and those names stuck. Carbon dioxide, on the other hand, the name indicates um, what's in it, the, the actual atoms that compose um, that particular compound. And so carbon, carbon uh, dioxide means there's um, the, this sphere in the middle is modeling carbon, and then the two red spheres are modeling, modeling oxygen, so carbon dioxide. So you can tell from the name uh, what it is. And so what we're going to have to do then is we're going to have to be able to, to be given a name, tell the type of compound it is, and how to write that formula for that particular compound. It's very important. So what we're going to practice today is some naming. All right. Now, before you can name a compound, you have to identify what type of a compound it is. And there's, um, there's three basic types of compounds. We're going to look at two of them. The third one we're not going to look at now. We'll come back later. Metallic compounds, we'll look at this later. But it's just um, formed by the strong attraction of different nuclei for the sea of electrons um, that are shared. It's the attractive force between the metal and metal um, atoms. We'll talk about this later. The two types of compounds, but the bottom line is they're all made of metals. And as long as you can identify an element as a metal, you can identify a metallic compound. But we'll come back to this later. The two types of compounds that you need to be familiar with are ionic compounds and covalent compounds. Um, because they have different rules for naming them, um, then you have to be able to identify, am I looking at an ionic compound or a covalent compound? The ionic compounds are formed by the strong attraction between oppositely charged species, typically a metal cation and a non-metal anion. So when you're looking, and then it's also some polyatomic ions that you'll have to come to recognize. But the metal, if you can, uh, if you, ha you have to have a periodic table handy when you're de describing the type of compound that you have, just look. 
is the um, element that's lift, listed first a metal? Is the element that's listed second a nonmetal? That's going to tell you it's an ionic compound. All right, and you use the periodic table as a guide to determine if it's a, a metal or a nonmetal. The covalent compounds are also called molecules, by the way. Ionic compounds are always referred to as compounds. Covalent compounds are called molecules. The word molecule means is indica indicative of the fact that the atoms are held together by covalent bonds. And so they're formed by the strong attraction of different nuclei for the same pair of electrons. We'll look closely um, at this type of compound in part two of lecture nine. For now, let's step back and take a closer look at um, ionic compounds.